The year was 2003, and the console was the GameCube. In that GameCube set a game by the name of Beautiful Joe, a side-scrolling beat-em-up game like none other before it. Do you want action? You got it. Do you want humor? You got it. Style? Say no more, fam. Listen, there is a lot you get in this game, but is it as good as you remember? Well, let's find out. It has been 21 years since the release of the original Beautiful Joe on the GameCube, and as the game stands today, it remains bound to the sixth generation of consoles. Now, as a kid, I always thought that this game was a banger, but let's also see its reception at that time from more prominent gaming media. As the game sits on Metacritic with a score of 93, a critic by the name of Gamer.tv stated, The most interesting feature in Beautiful Joe is the ability to control the speed of action. While Game Informer states, It's a rare gem that seamlessly blends new age technologies with gameplay of yesteryear. On the other end of the spectrum, a critic by the name of NetJack had this to say, The weak control scheme combined with parts of the game that are completely counterintuitive hamper the game tremendously to a point where a serious gamer will at best pick this up for rental. Now, these reviews alongside many others may carry some truth in them. However, that was then and this is now. I decided to go back and experience Beautiful Joe once again by replaying the game. So I want you to join me in my adventure to figure out what went right in this game and what went wrong to answer the most important question of all. Was Beautiful Joe good? Now to answer that question properly, I will be assessing the gameplay, the story, the voice acting, and its replayability. So let's get it on! The opening sequence of the game starts with your average Joe and his girlfriend Sylvia watching a movie called Captain Blue in a movie theater. While Sylvia wants some action from Joe, Joe is more intrigued by the movie itself. Then things get spicy. The six machine in the movie takes a direct blow that somehow knocks it into reality. As it recovers, it then grabs Joe and brings him back into the movie. Thus begins episode one, Joe the Hero. It is here where we get a monologue from Captain Blue telling Joe that since he was defeated, it is up to Joe to become the new action hero. But in this world, a true action hero must have a V-Watch. It is this simple moment at the start of the game that sets the tone for things to come. I mean, watch how animated Joe is. The game then slides a the player directly into the gameplay with tutorials that pop up along the way to help get the basics down. What makes these tutorials enjoyable is their bite size and how they gradually introduce Joe's capabilities over time versus one large data dump. After downing some of the regular mobs of the game, we are then brought face to face with Captain Blue and must defeat him to awaken Joe's true powers. With that skill check out of the way, we are now a certified action hero, baby. Henshin and go go, baby! You want some? Well, come and get it. With the power of VFX, Joe is now able to slow down time to dodge moves and of course damage some enemies. It is here where the game truly begins as a player is now free to experience what it has to offer and learn the intricacies of slow-mo. This is also a great segue to explain the user interface. At the top left of the screen is Joe's health which can be restored with cheeseburgers followed by his VFX meter right below it. If that meter runs out, he then turns back into regular Joe, which not only makes him powerless, but turns the screen a bit grainy. It is a small but nice touch to show the difference. Below the VFX meter sits Vs that tally up while fighting. The more Vs you get, the more V points you are rewarded to buy more health, items, and moves, but more on that later. At the very bottom left of the screen sits Joe's life, and last but not least, on the top right of the screen sits the V-Watch icon. Once 50 are collected, the VFX meter then gets extended by one stage for the current episode. As we make our way through this episode, we then enter a library where we face off against Bianco Billy and then must solve a simple puzzle to continue. The reason why I brought this area up in particular is because of its focus on slow-mo. 
The game wants the player to learn the advantages this mechanic brings, not only in combat, but also in progress. This will be a common occurrence going forward, but surely worth noting now. Progressing through the stage further, then brings us to our first mini-boss, a helicopter that's indoors. Yes, the first mini-boss is a helicopter, but more importantly, how in the hell are they flying it safely indoors? Anyways, with the power of slow-mo and punching the normal mobs into the helicopter, it's already over. This then brings us to the first power-up screen. It is here we can see that with our hard-earned V-points, we can extend Joe's life, unlock some moves for more stylish combos, and buy items if needed. Moving on to the second half of episode 1, here's another great example of using slow-mo in a simple but brilliant way with water drops. Then we are faced with a real battle against Captain Blue. Once he has been beaten, however, we earn the next power called Mach Speed. As its name implies, this is the opposite of slow-mo and a brief tutorial ensues. Now, Mach Speed comes in handy just like slow-mo at times, but I am a slow-mo fanboy. One fun but interesting thing about Mach Speed is how it can produce fire, which is used to clear another puzzle. With that being said, we have made it to the first boss in the game, Charles III. Now this fight is where we are officially tested on our ability to utilize the skills given to the environment. Charles has an interesting moveset, but luckily they are all dodgeable. It was also not apparent to me until it was over, but the pillars Charles knocks down could have been used against him. Anyway, it's the first fight so it's not meant to be dramatic as we have just started on Joe's journey. But I will say that the Beautiful Joe formula is much like the world around us. If you know how to do something properly, chances are you will finish your task way faster than someone else who has no clue. With that though, Charles III is no more. Now the game treats us to some comments from Joe himself and these little cliffhangers for the next episode, much like a corny TV show. And man, do I love it. Searching for Sylvia, Joe tries to track clues as to her whereabouts. Little did he know that the clues would only lead him to more problems. The next episode is some like it red hot. See you there. Some Like It Red Hot begins with Joe rising from the sewers and onto some pavement. After fighting some of the common foes thus far, we then encounter Captain Blue once again. His attack patterns are similar to that of the prior fights, it's just that he has more HP this go around. But with his cheeks clapped, we then unlock arguably the most important ability of all, outside of slow-mo, which is the zoom in VFX. This, when combined with slow-mo, makes Joe into a powerhouse of damage. It also changes the properties of a few moves in Joe's skill set. This will be shown shortly. But first, we have to make this dramatic and fly across town on top of a decked out bus driven by a cat and right into the next mini boss fight. Two helicopters. But with the power of slow-mo, they too get blasted. Our reward for that is entry into the Rhino Hotel. At the start of the Rhino Hotel, we encounter a new enemy type by the name of the Red Leader. Now, these POSs pop up a few times here and there, and most notably, in a room that broke my mind. I spent a little over 5 minutes at this one segment, as my pea brain could not handle the simplicity of this puzzle. All that you have to do is simply move the bomb to the side and uppercut it in slow motion to break the ceiling panel. I know that sounds extremely easy, but for some of us, it was not. Eventually, we make our way to the top of the hotel and are faced with the final puzzle before the brawl. A bomb appears in front of us and we must haul it up three chandeliers and then punch it into the wall panel to the right. This leads us to a bizarre lizard man named Hulk Davidson and I will let him say the rest. Interesting. Alright, spit it out, where you from? Huh? Now I'm surprised I know a punk like you from the real world knew about our plans, man. It ain't gonna matter. It ain't gonna matter anyway after I'm finished with you, you understand? So what's with the feed watch on your arm, man? What, you think you're some kind of mega man or something? <laughs> pretty cool, huh? I love Joe's reactions to the bosses in this game, man. It's just so silly. Anyway, this boss battle can be a bit brutal as Hulk can never sit still. His tackle move, also hits like a butt cheek on a stick, so do your best to dodge that. 
I found that the best way to damage him was through the missiles that he shot out after losing his axe temporarily. While not the fastest fight in the world, you can slowly and safely whittle away at his health. This is where the zoom in VFX would help too, but I did not realize that till later. Eventually, he falls. With Hulk down, our next lead happens to be under the sea. So now it's time for episode 3. Episode 2 did not have much worth of discussion, so if you happen to replay this game, do not feel too bad as it's only up from here, right? After a few upgrades, I welcome you to Episode 3, Two Million Leagues Under the Sea. This episode begins with Joe and the Six Machine blasting our way through the sky. Eventually, we end up face to face with an airplane. I am sure at this point you knew it was coming. With it taken out though, we then drop down into this huge open tunnel coming out of the sea. We are officially underwater. This first room here just consists of fighting the good old trash mobs to get a controller for the underwater propeller platform. With it resting on the big red button to the right of the stage, we can then move on to the rest of this level. Once we make it to the end, we get to face off against the Joker who pops up in every single episode and with him down, we then drain the water for this segment. We then make our way back to the beginning of the stage where we use that underwater propeller platform and we can now enter into the boss's door. This was originally blocked off due to the water keeping the door locked. All in all, this level has so far been the shortest in the game, but it is what it is. Moving on, this brings us to the next boss fight with the aquatic terror by the name of Grand Bruce. Now this is an interesting character, but here's Joe to tell you more. Wait, wait, wait. That sub goes to your hideout? Oh, my God. No, never mind, okay? Uh, but yeah, you have to know, mate. We need that girl for our dastardly plan to escape movie land <laughs> what? and rule the, the, you know, universe. The mechanics for this boss fight are fairly simple. Bruce has a couple of attacks, but the main one to look out for is his chomping dash. Luckily, bombs also come out at this time, which can enable us to damage him via the zoom in VFX to hit him with all kinds of damage. So rinse and repeat and he will fall. This is a much more straightforward fight than the previous ones, but that may be due to a better understanding of the game as time has gone on. With Bruce down though, it is now time for the beautiful escape. Much like the last stage, this one which happens to be in a submarine follows the same path in its execution. We must travel from one end of the submarine to the next, however, we must turn the submarine upside down to reach the engine room. Now there is not much to note here as most of this stage is pretty straightforward. Fight X enemies or reach X point to then platform to the next area. Once we reach the captain's room though, we are face to face with a new enemy by the name of Gelby. These guys are tanky as fuck. With them taken out though, we can turn this sub upside down. I also find this part to be a great segue into the wonderful world of platforming. From a design perspective, I will say that I do appreciate the work that was done on this stage in particular, knowing that the player would have to traverse the same area multiple times, but from different perspectives. Anyways, after disabling the missiles via the machinery room, we must once again head back to the captain's room to fly this old sub right side up once again. We then backtrack to where the missiles were located before, but this time with them caught in suspension, we have access to the engine room, where one of my favorite bosses in the game resides. That's right people, another Joe. A man of very few words, but much style. On one hand, I am not a fan of doppelganger boss fights. To me, it just feels a little bit lazy making me face off against myself versus a unique enemy. But another Joe for some reason always hits differently. Even though we hear Joe's remarks throughout the game plenty of times, there's just something about another Joe saying Henshin a go-go baby, or come on six machine, that just puts a smile on my face. But let me put that to the side here. 
Mechanic wise, another Joe can and will whoop you harder than you could have ever imagined if you give him the chance to. The more distance he has between you, the worse things will get as you will have no idea what he is doing. When you have the six machines shooting out blasts, him moving around distracting you, and his copies also flying at you from multiple angles, well congratulations, you have a problem. I will fully admit here that he whooped me for a good uh, 20 minutes until I finally understood the assignment. The reason why he was so challenging was because I allowed him to be. If you stay aggressively on another Joe, it is easy to turn the tables as he has no chance to do a damn thing. This is another example of how simple things in this game can be if you do it right the first time. When it comes to boss fights, I consider myself fairly cautious and would only aggressively pursue one if I knew their moveset. Yet in this case, being cautious just made me want to cuss. Once defeated, it is revealed that another Joe is someone else who we have yet to meet. More importantly, the submarine we are in gets attacked, so now it's time to make like a baby and hench in a go-go. This concludes episode 4, but wait, there's more. Episode 5 starts eerily similar to that of episode 2, but with a darker aesthetic. Here we see a mix of not only the Gelby from the prior episode, but also old classics such as the Verity and Crow Marty. Did I also mention that we get to face off against another tank? Oh, I didn't? Well, I did now. Right after that battle though, we also get to fight another Harrier, but this time with some of those annoying Crow Marty to make things even more challenging. Next, it's back through the sewers, but this time, there's lava. Why? Well, why not? Once out of the sewers yet again, we fight a Harrier again. This is then followed up by another tank fight and then another Harrier. So for the first half of this episode, we have fought all of two tanks and three Harriers. Now I'm not one to complain, but damn has that gotten old quickly. It eventually leads us to hopping onto a train though and making our way to the back of it to hit the brakes. There is nothing really of note here on this train segment as the main goal is to reach the very end of it. So if you end up playing this again, at some point, just make sure you ignore the enemies as they will cause you to fail this stage. With the train stop though, we have made it to our destination and come face to face with the mysterious Devil Boy. Alistair, in case you were not aware, was another Joe from the last episode. How? I have no idea. But more importantly, Alistair himself is the spirit manifestation of Dante's sword from the original Devil May Cry. Talking about breaking into a different Capcom series, Hideki Kamiya somehow managed to include the spirit of a sword from a different series into his little brainchild. What makes this all the more interesting is the inclusion of Dante on the PlayStation 2 port of Beautiful Joe, which came out a year later. This added more replayability into the game because bro, it's freaking Dante. Oh, but where was I? The fight with Alistair is not difficult in the sense of intensity, but more so due to so many things happening at once. During the battle, these cylinders rotate around the stage with lightning coming out of them while Alistair throws out a few different moves. One in particular involves him throwing swords at Joe while saying Air Raid, yet another throwback to Devil May Cry. Eventually, Alistair will go down though, and we are treated to an interesting scene. Why, you, you're pretty strong. And that move, the one you did back there? Tell me, what do they call you? Beautiful. Hmm. Well, yeah, that, that, that works. I'm Joe. Beautiful Joe. Think about that for a second. It was Alistair who gave Joe the title of beautiful. Man, this game just keeps on giving. You got the spirit of a sword from an entirely different game naming the main hero, but this train must keep going for him to save Sylvia, so now it's off to episode 6, The Magnificent Five. <laughs> Episode 5. 
Episode 6, as the title describes, is a boss rush consisting of the first four bosses of the game, followed by the Infernal Lord, Fire Leo. So you're the one who's been knocking down shadow members like dominoes. <laughs> the final battle! Okay, this is where I defeat you and get to go home with Sylvia as my reward, right? Right? You may as well give up, because I am going to foil all of your grand plans. My hero. Not bad, huh? <laughs> what a this boss fight in particular is one that will leave you scratching your head if you hardly use mock speed throughout your playthrough. For the majority of this fight, Fire Leo will run around a stage from either direction and he will spit out these rocks that will eventually explode. That is simple, but Fire Leo as his name states is on fire. So to damage him, we must fight fire with fire. So, with the power of mock speed, we can heat up Joe, then run over to fire Leo and smack him to neutralize his fire barrier. But he also has a shield that must be broken, which I like to take care of with a red hot kick. The fight then turns into a battle of attrition as you slowly chip away at his health. Once he hits his final bar of health, he goes into crackhead mode though, so it becomes even more challenging to get Joe fired up and then hit him. Fire Leo will also shoot fireballs in your direction. He will fall though, as long as you do not get greedy. This boss fight for me was the most challenging boss yet due to the balancing of damage and dodging involved. But with Fire Leo out of the way, surely we can rescue Sylvia now, right? Yeah, the game said it's gonna be a no for me dog. It appears there is one more enemy that we must take care of before it's finally over. We now enter the final episode of the game titled Episode 7, Joe and Sylvia. As a final stage, this one starts with us in a spaceship. Immediately this first section gave me trouble, as with some of the other things in this game, the goal was not extremely apparent. This part was all about traveling along the different floating platforms and slamming down with zoom in from the top of your jump. Once done correctly, you can completely press down the button for that area. If you recall at the very start of the video, that was a complaint from a person named NetJack. Now, at the end of the game, I will say that that counterintuitive remark does carry some weight, but more on that in a bit. The next portion of this beginning part is fighting more tanks yet again, but since they look different, technically speaking, they are different? This is then followed by fighting some Metal Leos, which are the baby version, you could say, of Fire Leo. Once they are taken care of though, it ends the first portion of the final episode. This next portion of the episode has this cool room in which you hit the missiles that rise from the ground to damage the spaceships you see floating in the background. Slow-mo naturally does more damage with the explosions on contact, but it is a clever little detail. It is here where the fun ends and what I call the gauntlet begins. As you travel on this moving platform, you must go through waves of enemies, which is fine and dandy, until you reach the next room where a timer begins. This serves as a DPS check as the game is hoping you have learned something up until this point. My issue with this however is the lack of checkpoints. If you end up dying at the end of the Metal Leos before the time runs out, well congratulations, it's time to do all of it again. This would not be such a big deal if this was the only area the game did not provide you with a checkpoint, but sadly it is not. There are portions in Beautiful Joe where the game requires you to do things properly the entire way through or you have to restart from the very beginning. Understandably, this can make a player frustrated as learning from your mistakes is one thing, but damn does it hit differently when you have to spend half an hour failing for a 5 minute segment. It now leads us to the final boss fight in the game and it is against none other than Captain Blue himself. The myth, the man, the hero, but not the hero who has also been training Joe for this very day. In a way, it is true that your father has died. In his place stands the master of the world, the all-powerful controller of light and dark, me, King Blue!
The fight against King Blue in the pimped out Megazord version of the Six Machine is difficult to say the least. King Blue appears to be resistant towards the good old slow-mo zoom-in punch, which makes this whole ordeal longer than it should be. This is not to say that it is impossible to beat him, but more so that it comes down to understanding his attack pattern. With so much on the screen, however, I can see how for many, this fight is complete and utter dog sh I mean awful. I feel like this boss in particular's HP or defense is just slightly too high, though this is the final battle in the game. I blew a, a good 30 minutes on this fight before I got the flow of it, but with King Blue out of the way now comes the man himself, Captain Blue. Contrary to the fight with King Blue, I found the Captain Blue fight to be fitting and fun. While most of his moves are what we have seen throughout the game, he does have one or two new ones up his sleeve. He is also more aggressive in this fight than in the past ones, which keeps the flow going. Once he is down though, that is it people. Beautiful Joe is a wrap. We not only got Sylvia back, but we also helped Captain Blue remember what's important. But this adventure isn't over yet as Captain Blue warns Joe that there will be at least two more times that the Earth will be in danger, meaning there will need to be a hero to save it. This is a hint towards a sequel and more, but we know that it won't be just Joe in the mix as Sylvia too wants to join in the fray. While the ending of Beautiful Joe is nothing more than a setup for the next game, in a way I do appreciate its simplicity. Since the game from the start never took itself seriously, there is no buildup of expectations at the end. Beautiful Joe is just simply Beautiful Joe. So now that we have gone through the game in its entirety, I believe it is now time to answer the most important question of all. Was Beautiful Joe good? At its core? Absolutely. From the very start of the game, it is captivating and unique. It is a game that wants you to play it and does not tie you down with unnecessary tutorials. While Joe's moveset and VFX powers are limited, from a casual perspective, it's just enough. Graphically speaking, it is a title that valued style over realism, and it still looks just as good as today as it did back in 2003. Let us not forget about the banging music in this game either. While it is clear that Beautiful Joe does a lot of things right, I would be lying if I said that this game was perfect, as it is far from that. Even though I thoroughly enjoyed my recent playthrough of the game, if you recall from the very beginning of this video, a user by the name of NetJack mentioned that the weak control scheme combined with parts of the game that are completely counterintuitive hamper the game tremendously to a point where a serious gamer will at best pick this up for rental. While I would argue that the control scheme is fine, they are right about some areas of the game being counterintuitive. Most of the puzzles in this game were fairly easy, but for difficult ones, when you got stuck, you got stuck. It was the same way for bosses. If you did not understand how to properly damage them, either the battle would go on forever, or you would just get stuck with no feedback from the game. Part of me appreciates that behavior, as it does make things challenging. However, with a game like this, I feel as though an optional hint system would have done wonders. Nothing invasive. Maybe a hint here or there after a few deaths and it could be an option that could be toggled on manually for those who want to play without it. The game could also have been more generous with its checkpoints in certain segments. However, this game is a product of its time. Regarding its replayability, this game has four playable characters in total. Joe and Sylvia are quite similar, but Alistair and Captain Blue help to break up that mix. To unlock them, you must play through the game on their respective harder difficulties. Voice acting wise, there is not much to say as we only have a handful of characters, but it is sufficient for what it's worth. As the main character, Joe's voice definitely fits his personality. How about we strike a bargain? You join our forces as the newest member of Shadow HQ, and once we've conquered the world, you can rule over half of it. Oh, and I'll throw in the girl as well. Even if you offered me the whole world, the real world doesn't need a sweaty flame blower like you. The world's hot enough with me in it. <laughs> with all of that being said, 
Beautiful Joe is still a game that if you haven't played yet, please, please do. It is a shame that it has not been freed from the 6th generation of consoles, as I am sure many would love to play it on their Nintendo Switch or even Steam Deck. But, I have said enough here. Beautiful Joe, please take it away.